So first of all, let's talk about block starts. Um, we'll start, of course, with the warm up. Uh, the warm up that you you see here is is the warm up practiced by almost all sprinters. And that's just a tuck jump, and sprinters have the ability to jump very high. Marcellus on the right is getting ready to jump, so pretty quick warm up here. You don't run laps to warm up to sprint. When you get into the blocks, um, sorry for getting right into the technical stuff, but we're, we're going to just dump a bunch of info here. When you get into the blocks, your knee should be about at your elbow. Your front knee should be about at your elbow. And that's, that's at your, the take your marks call. Now, sometimes this doesn't happen. This guy is a uh, terrific sprinter, but look how far his knee is past his elbow. That means his blocks are way too close to the line. If you look at him compared to, let's say, the guy in the red at the top, um, his blocks are really, really close, and that's going to end up creating really weird shin angles. Your front foot, um, I don't go through all the complicated stuff. This is Marcellus here. Um, you know, I, I think you just find the foot that works. And, you know, if it doesn't feel good, go with the other foot. So here's a weird story, though, with Marcellus. Um, when he went to, he graduated early, graduated in December. So he ran indoor track this year at Purdue at the age of 17. Matter of fact, he doesn't turn 18 till June 30th. But the first thing Purdue did, and this is just stupid as hell, um, they changed his feet in the blocks. And his dad had a meeting with Purdue's staff and said, said, are you kidding me? And they let him change back. So yeah, I would say if you have a kid that ran 1031 when he was 15, that you shouldn't be changing feet. I, I would never consider changing anyone's feet. I might say, why don't you try the other way? see if you like it better, but I think you just find it naturally, organically, and you'll hear my son Alec when he's talking about the high hurdles. You don't have a choice if you're running the high hurdles because your lead leg must be your back leg in the blocks. You have no choice. If you don't do that, you're going seven step, which isn't smart, to the first hurdle, or nine step, which is not smart, to the first hurdle. Almost all high school hurdlers are eight step hurdlers to the first hurdle. Now I'll go back here to Marcellus. Marcellus, he's pretty far back. Uh, I, I think he's more than two, three, three, three feet here. And I would never move him up. Now I could say you're pretty far back, but I would never move him up if he's strong enough to handle this. And here's another guy that was strong enough. Marcellus' uh, block starts looks very much like Michael Johnson's block starts. If I was coaching Michael Johnson, I would never mess with him unless he was having trouble and came to me and said, Coach, what else should I try? Well, the first thing I would try if he was having trouble with this is to move him up some. This is way back, and I think you got to be really, really strong. And you should always be careful when you're copying elite athletes. In your set position, your hips should always be above your shoulders. This is something that um, I see anytime I see a tabletop type of, of back. Um, it seems like I see this in a lot of girls meets in, um, in Illinois, boys and girls are segregated. Um, so many times I see girls not having the same fundamentals as boys. But as you can see, Marcellus here is the second guy over. Um, the guy in, in lane one has a, a, a neck that's bent way down. He has a curved back. But you should have a straight back, and the, uh, the hips should be above the shoulders. You should have a bridge with your hands. That means you are not flat-handed on the ground. And your eyes should be on the track. Some really good sprinters in this picture. Now, once in a while, you'll see a guy make a mistake. This guy here is named Kerry Lockhart in the purple. He's actually a 10-4 a sprinter, terrific, terrific runner. And I would say his coach never knew that this was happening. If you do not take pictures and do not video, you will miss 
huge mistakes that your, your kids are making. Now, Marcellus on the right has a nice bridge ready to go, but, but Lockhart is flat handed against the ground. Now I'll tell you what's gonna happen here. If you look at this, Marcellus just, just killed him out of the blocks. I mean, you could not be flat handed and get out well. I'm sure he still ran a good time because he's really fast, but you, you have to avoid mistakes. One of the key things in, in block stars, and I think in coaching in general, whether you're talking about Alex material later or Quinn's material later, or even a golf swing or a tennis swing, do not fill a kid's head with 50 things. Um, it, clutter in the brain keeps kids from performing well. So when you coach kids on blocks, uh, make sure that you're, um, that you're giving them one thing to look at. One thing, you know, you may give them something else the next day, but you don't want to read from a list of 50 things. One of the biggest mistakes people make, um, the know-nothing coaches uh, actually have just one cue coming out of the blocks, and that's stay low. It's so weird. Their one cue is 100% wrong. You cannot stay low. I actually witnessed a, a head coach um, at, at a big school one time uh, having a, some type of rod or pole uh, across the track where his guys were supposed to go underneath that pole. And it just causes all kinds of problems. You want to come up and out, up and out. This is a very explosive look here. You're going to see this a lot. When you cue to stay low, this is what happens. You get this artificial low. You get this bend of the hips. You get really weird angles. You see your shin angle is going almost straight up, which is, that's not what you want. You're going to see a lot better pictures coming up. This is probably one of the worst pictures you'll ever see. But it's really important to see bad pictures as well as good pictures so you know the difference between good and bad. But if, if, you, if you'll just stop saying stay low. Now, one of the problems, this girl here may not be able to stay low. So you almost have to allow this girl to come up at maybe more than a 45 degree angle. Uh, developmental kids need more of a vertical component compared to advanced sprinters. Um, so maybe your best sprinters will be able to come out at like a 40 degree angle and then your a tall freshman may come out at a 70 degree angle and that's okay. The worst thing to do is take that weak long-legged freshman and tell him to come out as low as your best sprinter. One of the key things, we'll talk about this over and over again. Um, I say push, push, push about a hundred times a day. It seems like push, push, push. We are constantly pushing. This is Marcellus pushing. The guy on the left was, the best silver medalist in the history of the state of Illinois, Travis Lindsay. And, and the push is, is something you've really got to do when you get out. Um, here's a bad pick. Okay. The, the, the one before good pick, bad pick. Now this is a model that um, if you look up sprint starts, you find this guy and, and it's, it's pretty crazy. See the problem with that foot, with that vector of the front foot is that his that it that his force is going to go down into the track and down into the track is exactly what we want when we're tall and sprinting as fast as we can but we do not want this when we're coming out of the blocks we want to push behind us not down this guy here is my one of my favorite kids i've ever coached and i've only coached him for about six weeks Lavelle Patterson came out as a junior this year. Um, he was a cast off from basketball and he was our fastest runner. Now, just because you're fast does not mean you come out of the blocks well. This is Lavelle <laughs> in an early practice and this is really, really ugly. Um, a bad shin angle of the first uh, you know, on his lead step. Uh, we would like it much more down the track. His eyes are up looking forward. He has a bend in the knee. He's not getting much of a push. He's artificially low. I mean, this is very frustrating um, to see this, you know, like how are we ever going to get him right? After one month of practice, we got him right. 
Let's look at that again. That was early, a month later. Now he's got the big push from the back foot or the front foot, I'm sorry. He has the really good shin angle coming out. And this kid was, yeah, he's gonna be a college track athlete. So this is what you can do if you'll coach kids. All right, who will win the race here? This is, this is not something I brag about. Actually, I do brag about it because if I would not have been taking pictures here at the start of this race, I would have never known that Devon Rabowski uh, was as effed up as he really was. Uh, the guy in lane four has a very good shin angle. The guy in lane two has a very bad shin angle because it's too low. And then Devon, um, uh, he told me his hurdle coach had told him that he needed to bunch up his start. He is so, he might only be about 13 inches from the starting line with the front foot. If you do that, his angle is going to be straight up. And so that's where, if the force is going in that direction, you're going to go straight up. So that, that's a, a really bad deal. Uh, the guy who won the race, obviously, is the guy in lane four. Here's the, the best uh, starter, maybe, in all of uh, track and field, Christian Coleman. And you see him really powerful, pushing out big, strong vectors. I, I took this at the 2017 NCAA championships. This is when he won the NCAAs. It's not just uh, track athletes that need to practice these shapes. Taylor Lewin came out of the University of Michigan in 2014 and shocked the world when he ran a 4.8540 at 6'7", 315 pounds. And once again, look at the, uh, the triple extension and the uh, great angle um, of the front shin. Uh, angles are so important. You'll, you'll hear this over and over again as I speak. I love this picture because there's no blocks. Um, they dug holes in the cinder track. The reason why they first came out with blocks in track and field was because of the holes that were being dug by the sprinters. It was not to improve sprinting or anything like that. So, you know, J Jesse is pushing really hard out of a hole in the track, but you see an incredible shin angle and he's really strong, doing a good job there. Uh, this is Ben Johnson and a, a couple other guys. Ben Johnson's the guy on the right, I believe. Um, I forgot who the other guys even are. But these guys are really projecting their hips. Big, big push. You know, we, don't, we never want to be quick out of the blocks. We want to be big and strong out of the blocks. Big push. Really good shin angles. You see the split of his hands. We're going to talk about the split of his hands in just a minute. This guy's pretty good. Big, strong push. You see the great shin angle. See, once you start recognizing these shapes, then you can start helping kids. Now, it's not always your elite sprinters that are doing it right. This kid was a freshman hurdler running against, I believe, a sophomore hurdler on the right. But, you know, that's a big push, good split of the hands. I mean, everything looks great there. One of the cool things I think about with, with block starts is you can teach the all of your sprinters and even like a 315 pound offensive tackle you can teach kids how to come out now you may not be able to coach them on how to run a 0 0.92 in the 10 meter fly but you can definitely teach kids to come out correctly uh, this is actually a picture of a rip see marcellus on this picture has already split once when i say split that means your hands split apart. So on this, after you split, your hand that's back rips through. So if you can picture, okay, in this one, um, my guy has a left hand uh, up in front, just like Marcellus would have, with a right hand back. Here, he's ripped through. So it's a split and a rip with the upper body. And then with the lower body, it's a push, push, push. Now, if I would have drawn arrows on this, you would have seen that those backwards arrows, um, your, your shins are pointing forward, your force is going backwards, and that's how you push yourself into a top speed position, uh, position eventually. Some ugly pictures. Uh, another model that, that is showing good block form here. Uh, obviously, the shin angle is horrible, but even worse, 
I'm not really a, no, I'm, I don't know of any good coaches that tell athletes to drag their toe, but this is the opposite of dragging your toe. This is a, um, somehow you've kicked your butt coming through and your toe should never be that far off the ground. Most of you see the, the problem here. This is like uh, somebody selling starting blocks or something. And they have this person that obviously has never run a race in her life up there with her eyes up and forward. Her hips are not, um, are about the same level as her shoulders. So yeah, this is pretty ugly. Good bridge though, I guess. Now this is one of my favorite pictures. This was my second best freshman sprinter last year. And he, he's going to be our top sophomore this year. And, and first of all, he's coming way up. I mean, like those shin angles are really high, really high. Now, what's crazy is look in the magnifying glass. Most people did not see this until they, you know, I had to like tell people what was going on. Can you see what's happening here? He actually is leading with his front foot in the blocks. His back foot in the blocks is still in the blocks. I didn't even know this was possible. When I showed him the picture, he didn't even understand what I was talking about. But the more I talked about it, he finally understood and did not even have any clue he was doing it. And uh, you can't be a very good starter if you're leading with your front foot. Once again, I don't cue to drag the toe, even though many, many elite sprinters do this. And um, Marcella started doing it last year. He must have been getting coached from somebody else because I, you know, I, I just shook my head and said, why are, you, why are you dragging your toe? He goes, oh, I don't know. I think it's just happening, you know, whatever. Uh, not big enough that I would say don't do it or anything. But I would never let anybody come out of the blocks like this with the big high heel recovery. You should never be off the ground looking like this. Uh, these, these guys are actually coaches that put out instructional videos. And if, if the goal coming out of the starting blocks was to jump as high as you possibly could, this guy would be an Olympian. But, but that's not the goal. The goal is to push the ground behind us, keeping our feet as close as we can to the track. And yeah, this might be a cool picture or something, but it's, it's bad stuff. Some things that uh, uh, the shin angles, as we've said, really important in any type of drive acceleration pattern. Um, you want to see the track because if your eyes are up, then you have a tendency to come up too high. Big and strong. What is the opposite of big and strong? Uh, short and weak. Yeah, you definitely don't want to be short and weak coming out of the blocks. Uh, driving out. You want to be big and strong. Here's that push, push, push. It's one of my favorite cues. Push, push, push. Don't spin your wheels. Um, I've actually heard some coaches talk about being quick out of the blocks. You need to be patient out of the blocks. You want to wait for speed. Big, strong pushes, not short, little, quick steps. Fewest steps wins. I heard Latif Thomas say this 10 years ago, and, and this is true. If you're taking big and strong, powerful movements, um, you're not going to be taking six-inch steps. So, so the fewest steps wins is a pretty good cue. Here we're seeing great shin angles. This is actually the rip phase. Um, remember, the split is with the first step, but the first step here is on the ground. At least it is for my guy, Tommy Harris. Um, and, then, um, and then the rip is the second phase of the arms. But you're push, push, push every time with your feet. Big, strong pushes. This is Carlos Boggett that uh, graduated from me three years ago, four years ago, maybe. And uh, big, strong pushes. Now, this strength phase here, we'll talk about a little bit more at the end. But strength coming out is, is very important but I'm not sure you develop that strength in the weight room. I'm a huge believer in being specific in what you're trying to do. 
we get really good at accelerating by accelerating. It may look like Carlos, the guy on the right, may have been in the weight room every day of his life, but I'm telling you right now, he was not. Um, in terms of being a, he was a football player. Um, in terms of being a weightlifter, I'd give him about a two on the scale of 10. In terms of time spent, um, you know, the focus, you know, how much it helped him. Um, sprinters typically are naturally strong, which leads people to think like, oh, we need to get in the weight room more because we want to look like these two guys. And, um, and what I have found is that the weight room does not help um, a great deal. You want to actually do accelerations to get good at accelerations. Marcellus and Carlos, uh, senior freshman here. And once again, great push, eyes down, real good, big, strong, tall bodies. Um, it's weird. I said tall and I'm like, well, you're not, you're not really trying to be tall in your, in your acceleration, but in a way you are, you're, you're just, you're tall in a, in a diagonal way, but your body is, is never uh, leaking at the, at the, at your ankles, your knees, or your hips. By leaking, you're never mushy in your ankles, your knees, and your hips. You want to be stiff and long. You never want to be uh, collapsing. Here you have Tommy Harris coming out, just a really good angle. Good stuff, good shin angles. More for Marcellus, but these two guys that he's running against are really, really good. But Marcellus is, is technically so much better. Um, you see a, uh, um, a guy on his left that's really putting force down into the ground, whereas Marcellus is putting it back behind him. Um, the guy on his right, he's running at Kentucky now, I think. Um, he's putting it down. And I don't know if you can see it with the boxes the way they are, but, um, but there's a guy on the right that's upright and, and putting force totally straight down into the ground. And that's why he's in lane one and, you know, get last place in the race. Great angle. We just we got to keep looking for these great angles. Okay. How do you practice this stuff? Um, I think this is important. I posted this uh, on Twitter the other day and quantum physics scientists learned that observing affects the observed. What we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed. What Heisenberg said, and of course Heisenberg was famous because of uh, uh, Walt White, that was his drug name, um, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But when Heisenberg was observing subatomic particles, he understood that the act of observing was changing the observed, was changing the way the particles acted. So he was always uncertain about what the true reality really would be at the subatomic level. Well, the same thing happens as coaches. If we closely observe our athletes, they will, they will change their behavior. So I think close observation is really good. When we video athletes, they will change their behavior. By the way, all their behaviors here will be changed to the better. Sometimes I hold up my phone like I'm videoing a start or something and that um and and i'm not even using the video i am simply doing it to increase the focus and intent of the athlete and uh, uh it works measurement is really important by measurement it could be a linear measurement of like five bounds or something or it could be a time measurement so we time our starts often and then the fourth thing is competition. Sometimes we will compete. Sometimes we'll compete and time and video and watch closely. If you're doing all four of those things, holy shit, your guys are going to be on fire. They're going to be doing, their focus is going to be so good. If you go tell them to go work on block starts, none of these things will happen and you'll get nothing done. Now, this is, this is how we, uh, I think this is the best way to time starts. We get in the blocks, we put a free lap cone on the first boys hurdle mark, and hit the start button, and then we put a free lap cone on the second boys hurdle mark, 
and we put, hit the, the finish button on it. So in essence, what we're doing here, it's 15 yards to the first hurdle and the boys hurdles. It is 10 yards between hurdles. It seems really weird in a metric event, like the 110 meter high hurdles, that the hurdles would be 10 yards apart, but that is the fact. So the lines are on the track, really easy to use. And the reason why I like this, two reasons. One is we time with free lap and we do not like the push button, thumb button, um, uh, free lap starter. We would much rather use a start cone and finish cone. So what we're doing here, um, we're eliminating that thumb pad. And the other thing that's just fantastic about this is that you don't want people hurrying their acceleration. We want to be big and strong. And so this kind of emphasizes that we don't really care about how fast you are for the first 15 yards. We care about how fast you can get your body at about the 15 yard mark. So it just really emphasizes what needs to be emphasized. Now, if you do not have free lap, you're probably just going to have to time 25 yard starts. You just try to be careful, keep explaining that you don't want to be um, quick step. You don't want to spin your wheels. You don't want to take tiny steps. You don't want to be quick. Yeah, you want to be big and strong. But when you time the way we do, I think it's, it's just perfect. And this, uh, this, these are our times. Um, really, really interesting though, if you look, Marcellus, obviously, this is from 2019. Um, Marcellus obviously is the fastest guy on the team. That doesn't, should not surprise anybody. He's the fastest guy in the history of Illinois. Well, is he much faster though? I mean, Cale Bronner, Nate Simpson, neither of them, they were both like JV sprinters for me. They never one time ran in the hundred or the four by one. They were not great track athletes at all, but they were pretty good at pushing out. Um, you have to go down. Uh, uh, Bones and Capizio were both on my four by one team. Uh, but there's a lot of false positives here. So what this tells me is that the, the race is not won in the first 25 meters or the very start. Now, it may be lost if you really suck coming out. But there's not much difference between really fast sprinters and not so fast sprinters in the early portions of the race. So what is the difference between a Marcellus and a Cale Bronner? It is definitely the max speed. Stuart McMillan um, once said that the winner of the 100 meters is going to be the guy who's running the fastest at the 60 meter mark. So what that tells me is that, yeah, work on your starts. Yeah, they're important. But the most important thing we can do in track and field has nothing to do with what I'm talking about today. It is getting your max speed as high as it can be. The max speed is the, the important thing for a sprinter. And here's the other thing. The faster your max speed, the more it will improve your acceleration. It doesn't work the other way around. If Marcellus gets a little better at his acceleration, his max speed probably stays the same. So, so yes, work on all the things we're talking about today. It's not hard, but it is not going to be the key to all state sprinting. Um, we're kind of co controversial because we don't push sleds. I know a lot of good coaches that push sleds. We do not. Does this look like an angle of, a, of an acceleration? Of course it does. And so coaches love this. And there's so many people addicted to strength in this country and and everywhere is this is what they want to do. What they don't want to do is actually do accelerations with spikes on and time them and all that kind of stuff. So we just don't do it. We don't pull sleds either. If we did pull sleds, we would pull light sleds. I know Brian Kula talked about no more than 10% of his uh, body weight for uh, Christian McCaffrey, no more than 10%. Uh, but we don't pull sleds. I just think, you know, why would we ever want to run artificially slow? Uh, oh, yeah, you get stronger, though. But you get really strong by doing things that are specific as well. And the nervous system gets ready or gets very accustomed 
to the demands of what you're trying to do. Uphill running. Uh, it looks like an angle that's pretty good there. You know, you, you, it sure looks like you're in acceleration mode and all that kind of stuff. So people love to run uphill. Once again, the people who want to push sleds, pull sleds, and run uphill, they, they must be bored with doing the actual thing. The actual thing works really, really well. And then there's this. You know, you don't plant beans and grow corn. Every strength and conditioning person, every person that owns a weight room, they all want to do this and then tell their athletes that this is going to make them faster. And it doesn't. Oh, and then they'll say, well, at least in acceleration, it's really going to help them. And I hate to say it, but I, I just don't agree. I'm not telling people not to lift. I mean, you know, I, I think that all football players have to lift, body armor, collision sport. All my football players will always lift weights. They always will. But don't pretend that lifting weights is going to be the key to your acceleration and definitely not the key to your max speed. 